So what would it take to convince you uh, or to convince someone you know uh, to believe in Jesus? I mean, and by that, by that, this is, what, this is what I mean. Believe that he is the son of God, God incarnate, who came to this earth in human form and uh, ultimately died on a cross. And uh, it's through that sacrifice that he provides the salvation, the forgiveness of sins uh, for, for mankind. And believe that he rose from the dead. And believe that uh, he is the only means of salvation, our only hope. Uh, for eternal life and the forgiveness of sins, and believe that following him is the best way to live life. That's what John has been telling us from the beginning of his gospel. We've been uh, journeying through his gospel now since April of 2022, so uh, going on a year and a half that we started that, and uh, uh, that's what John's been telling us. And his purpose in writing, he's going to tell us today in the passage we look at, and again in a little bit, in a, in a few weeks down the road, uh, is that we can believe, that we can believe what he saw, what he experienced, what he was an eyewitness of, and uh, is passing that along. So that's what the Gospel of John is. It's an eyewitness account of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. John witnessed it all, saw it all, wrote it down, wanted other people to come to believe in Jesus like he had come to believe in Jesus. You could say that John would say believing in Jesus, trusting him, and following him was the best thing that ever happened to him. And those who truly know Jesus, that's their same story. When you really know Jesus, you can say it is the best, most awesome, amazing event, experience, thing that's ever happened to me. He changed my life. He continues to change my life, making it better, uh, sometimes making it harder, sometimes making it easier, but there's no guarantee of an easy life. And I think you know that. So we're going to look at a few more of those things that John is giving us as evidence, evidence. Um, he, he, he gave us uh, some of that last week uh, in those uh, fulfilling of Scripture. John has said several times this was done in order to fulfill Scripture. Um, Jesus, in, in our journey last week, we saw how he just bowed his head, gave up his spirit. What that means is he, will, he willed his own death. He said, it is finished. Everything has been accomplished. It's like God had a checklist. And God was checking it off. This is what I said was going to happen. And boom, there it is. And when everything pertinent to the cross had been checked off, Jesus bowed his head and willed his own death. And so all these things were foretold in advance. And now it's time, we come to our passage today, to dispose of his body. And uh, the Romans had a couple of ways of taking care of the bodies. One way was just to leave it on the cross. I mean, crucifixion uh, was perfected by them. It was not invented by them, but it was perfected by them to instill terror in the territories that they occupied. That if you cross Rome, this is what's going to happen to you. And usually, and not uncommon for somebody to hang on a cross for a couple of days, and so they wanted to instill fear and terror. And then after the person had died, leave them on the cross. Let the vultures and the crows start picking away at their bodies. Or take them down from the cross, throw them along the side of the road that was heavily traveled as roadkill. And just lay there like you and I would see a dead deer or groundhog on the side of the road, except it was a human being. Yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible, but Rome would do that to say, do not cross us. This is what will happen to you if you do. Now, that practice was abhorrent to the Jews. Uh, they believed that a dead body would defile, if they came in contact with a dead body, if, they, if it was on, it, just, it would defile the land. So they, uh, they had other practices. They didn't practice crucifixion themselves, but they wanted a body to be buried as quickly as possible, which is still common, by the way. I've got a friend who's from Egypt, and he said, even in Egypt to this day, when somebody dies, it's their goal to have that body in the grave by the end of the day. So they're not so much worried about embalming, and they're not so much worried about you know, calling hours and the practices that we've become accustomed to. Uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of, and that was the Jewish mentality, to, to get that body in the grave just as soon 
as possible. So I want to read John 19, starting at verse 31. These will be up on the screen. We'll go to the end of that chapter. Now it was the day of preparation. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and another scripture says they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. And now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb which no one had ever been laid. And because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So the first thing I want us to look at today is some foreshadowing, foreshadowing. Uh, foreshadowing is a, a, a narrative device in which a storyteller gives an advance hint of what is to come later in the story. And a good author weaves those things into their stories. Well, God is doing more than telling a story, but he has been weaving foreshadowing in through the documents that we call the Old Testament. 39 books of those, uh, different separate documents uh, combined together in one that we call the Old Testament. The Jewish people called it their scriptures. They don't call it the Old Testament. Uh, they still refer to it as their scriptures. So uh, God has been weaving, foreshadowing in, and we see this with the Passover. Now, if you've maybe not read it in Exodus, maybe you've watched it in The Prince of Egypt, maybe you've watched it with The Greatest Story Ever Told, you know, in, in movies, but you'll recall how the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt for 430-some uh, years, and uh, God eventually sent Moses and to bring them out, to go to Pharaoh and say, set my people free. So Moses went down to Egypt, said that to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, no way, not going to happen. There's this series of uh, nine plagues, things like frogs and insects and and things happening that was just devastating to the whole land. And it culminated in the death of the firstborn of everyone in Egypt who did not do this. This is what God said to the Israelites. What I want you to do is to take a lamb. And I want you to sacrifice it. I want you to roast it. I want you to eat it. But I want you to take some blood and put it around uh, the door frame of your house. And at night, on this particular night, the angel of death is going to come through the land of Egypt... And he is going to strike down dead the firstborn of every male in every household uh, where the blood is not over the doorposts. That was the only requirement. So if you believed, if you had faith, if you trusted what God had said to Moses, and now Moses is saying it to the people, you would have taken that lamb, you would have sacrificed it, you'd have had a good roast lamb meal, and then you would have put blood around the doorpost. But if you just ate the lamb and didn't put the blood on the doorpost, guess what's going to happen? You know, so it was that act of faith, taking God at his word, trusting him to do what he said he was going to do, trusting to bring deliverance, putting the blood around the doorpost, and the angel of death would pass over. And so for centuries it has been called Passover. So it's that time of the year. And it's more than coincidental that Jesus was crucified during Passover. Because there's another kind of Passover that's happening that will happen to all of those who, in a sense, trust God in the same way that the Israelites did uh, by that, that fountain filled with blood. A lot of symbolism in our music, right? A lot of symbolism. And there's not a literal fountain somewhere, you know, in coming up from the ground. There's no 
you know, but it, it's very symbolic, but also very real. The fountain is what happened on the cross with Jesus. I mean, talk about his blood being shed. I mean, he, it was because uh, of the, the thorns, crown of thorns, because of the nails in his forearms and in his feet, and because of the, the, the beating, that, the flogging that he received, and because of that spear stuck in his side. You know, it's referring to his death, his sacrificial death, which was gory, which was bloody. And so that's when we sing about the fountain filled with blood. We're referring to the sacrifice that Christ was making on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins, where he was, as we've learned in the last couple of weeks, literally drinking the cup of the wrath of God that we deserve. He took it upon himself, and for the six hours that he was on the cross, there was a transfer that was happening, and this is amazing. He looked into the future, he saw you and me, and he transferred our sins onto the body of Jesus while he was on the cross and he took all of my punishment, all of my guilt, everything that I'd ever done wrong, he took it upon himself, he drank that cup and he gave up his spirit and died. That's the fountain filled with blood. And when I take that, when I put my faith in Jesus and I'm trusting what he did on my behalf nearly 2,000 years ago, I am trusting him, his sacrificial death on my behalf. And I think that faith also extends to what we'll get into next week. He arose from the dead and he's alive forevermore. And so that's the foreshadowing. So you see the foreshadowing that a couple thousand years before the coming of Christ, God is foreshadowing what's going to happen. And by doing that, he's preparing us because it is an amazing, almost unbelievable story. Now, thousands of people were crucified. Only one arose from the dead. We don't sing about the other two that were crucified on that day. We sing about the one that rose from the dead. So the resurrection is that stamp of, of approval, that final affirmation of the truth. And so there's this foreshadowing that happened through the Passover. And then again, there's fulfillment of Scripture. There are over 300 predictions or prophecies, or as I like to call them, promises, found in what we call the Old Testament about Jesus Christ. Peter Stoner, in his classic work, Science Speaks, calculated the chance of any one man fulfilling these prophecies, 300 plus, even down to the present time to be one in, that's 100 billion, 10 to the 17th power, one in 100 billion, one person fulfilling 300 prophecies. The likelihood of that happening is greater than the likelihood of evolution. You know, the earth just, the universe coming out of nothing. So anyway, um, so we, we, we've got, so we saw some of these last week. Uh, when they divided his clothes and cast lots, uh, they, they were Jesus is hanging on the cross before he died. They took his garments and it was common practice for the uh, soldiers. It was called a quaternion, four soldiers who would be there. They took different parts of his clothing. And then there was this seamless garment that was the undergarment, kind of like the underwear, the undergarment that was all, all of one piece. And they, instead of cutting it up or dividing it, they, they cast lots. I don't know, they rolled dice or they drew the longest stick or they played rock, scissors, paper. You know, they, they, they basically, the winner of this gets the seamless garment. So, and even that was prophesied, talked about in scripture. That's Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. And then Jesus on the cross said, I thirst, I thirst. And that was more than just thirsting physically, although that would have been the case. A lot of bodily fluids has been lost. He would have been thirsty. He needed to be able to cry out, which when he said, it is finished, he didn't go, it is finished. He, he yelled it. He screamed it in a loud voice. He would have needed perhaps moisture. But I think it's more than that. For the first time, the, the eternal righteous son of God was separated from his father and the thirst that every human being experiences from, uh, from being cut off from God, separated from God, that thirst hit him, and he cried out, I thirst, because of that separation. 
And that comes from Psalm 69, 21. Then there's some more that we see from this passage of Scripture. In John 19, 31 to 37, this is where uh, the Jewish leaders wanted the bodies taken down, not just Jesus, but the other two that were crucified with him. They didn't want them hanging on the cross, left there uh, during the Passover. And uh, it was getting late in the day. Jesus I was hung on the cross at 9 a.m. Last week I misspoke on that. But anyway, uh, he died about 3 p.m. And sundown is about 6 p.m. And and that's significant because sundown starts a new day. Not like sunrise for us or 12 o'clock. They didn't go by that. But sundown started a new day. And, and, And so they, and that would have been the Passover. So they didn't want... The body's on the cross during Passover, so they needed to hurry. And like I said, uh, sometimes a body would be on a cross for a couple of days. And they didn't want that to happen. So what would happen is they would go and break the legs of a person that's being crucified. Now sometimes you see pictures of crucifixion and there's nails in the hands. Probably didn't happen there because that would have broken bones. Probably would have been in the forearm because you could go through these two bones here and not break one. But Probably also those arms would have been tied onto that cross beam and their feet would have a, a little uh, ability to be able to push up so their legs would be bent because what a person being crucified would need to do to take a breath would be to stretch their legs and pull with their arms and get a breath and then drop. And so the breaking of the legs, which would be gory in itself, I remember seeing a girl who had a bike accident that broke her leg up here and it just you know, went like that. And it was kind of like one of those things that st- turns your stomach. There was no bones protruding, but it was. And I have seen that too, which is gory in and of itself. But it's like, ah. so to break the legs, the, these lower legs, so that you could no longer push up to get a breath and then you would die by asphyxiation or suffocation rather quickly. So that's what they wanted to happen. So they go and they see the two uh, other, they they come up there and and they break this guy's legs. They break this guy's legs. They go to Jesus. Now these are people that are uh, skilled in recognizing death from crucifixion. They get to Jesus and they recognize he's already dead. So there's, there's one witness to the death of Christ. These soldiers didn't break his legs because they knew he was already dead. But that not one of his bones would be broken uh, goes back to the Passover in, in, when they were preparing the, 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 the lamb for their meal. It says in Exodus 20, 40, or 12, 46, not one of his bones, do not break any of the bones of the Passover. Don't break any of the bones. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 uh, clears some things up for us. Paul wrote and said, For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So the early Christians, Paul and others, understood that Jesus was our Passover lamb. So they did not break the legs of Jesus in fulfillment of Scripture. It's one of those 300 plus. God's timing is perfect. We saw that. It's like Jesus from the night before and earlier than that, picked the time of his death. Picked the time of his crucifixion, picked the, uh, the means of his crucifixion. He has said that it, it, throughout, you read through John's gospel, you find out Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be mocked, I'm going to be flogged. He said this, you can read those in the gospels, all of that is part of the fulfillment of scripture. Um, but he had to die before they came to break the legs. Otherwise, scripture would not have been fulfilled. So you see God in total control even of that aspect of the cross. John is claiming to be a factual source. A factual source. This is John raising his right hand and saying, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And he claimed that in in the verses here. He says, the man who saw it. Now, John never referred to himself in first person. Like he never said, John, he referred to himself as the the disciple whom Jesus loved. Do you know that you're the disciple that Jesus loved? You're the disciple. You're the disciple. John could say, I was his favorite. But Peter could say, I was his favorite. You could say, 
I was his favorite. I am his favorite because he loves all of us equally and the same. And so John never referred to himself, but he says, I was there. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies to it so that you also may believe. Now, this is specifically referring to while on the cross, after Jesus had died, and they didn't break his legs, this one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced Jesus in the side. Now, normally when you pierce somebody, you know, in, in the arm, and the leg, in the side, whatever, blood flows out. But in this particular instance, blood and water flowed out. And John is saying there's something unusual about that. You don't normally see that at a crucifixion. You don't normally see blood and water coming out. And, and there are um, those who believe, medical personnel that would believe that's because Jesus' heart ruptured and, and the, somehow the, the, the moisture, the liquid in the pericardium, am I saying that right? I'm looking at a, a nurse down here. You know, in the pericardium sac, the blood and the, the, the serum, the liquid separated. And uh, when they pierce that, then that's what came flowing out. John said that this is an eyewitness. You know what? Not only was John an eyewitness, but there was Mary and Mary and Mary, and there were other people there. Apparently, Nicodemus was there. Apparently, uh, Joseph of Arimathea was there. They're not, because they, they're coming and getting the body, and then they apparently witnessed these things. But the amazing thing to me is I, I begin to look at all of Scripture, is that God doesn't work in an isolated corner somewhere. By that, what I mean is give one person revelation and say, go out and convince everybody else. You know, even when Moses went up on the mountain, did you know Aaron went up with him? And there's another occasion when Joshua went up with him. And the whole Israelite community saw and heard. They at least saw the, and, and heard the thunder and the lightning. So this is not Moses going off into a cave and getting a revelation and coming back and saying, look what God told me. This is not Moses getting some special tablets and saying, look, I need some special glasses in order to be able to interpret this. This was done in broad daylight. This was done in, in the, uh, witnessed by hundreds, thousands of people. And that's the way God rolls. That's the way God operates. So whenever there's a religion or a cult or, uh, that's dependent upon one person's revelation, and then they have to go and convince other people, but it's all dependent on the one person, Steer away from it. Stay away from it. And what you have throughout all of Scripture is multiple witnesses, multiple centuries. What we have in the New Testament is multiple witnesses of the resurrection of Christ and, and those testimonies. And then you have the testimony of the early church. Well, we're not going to get into all that. But what you have is factual source. In other words, you have evidence God did not, he, he, God knew how unbelievable this story was going to be. Becoming a man. I mean, that, that, that's amazing in and of itself. Becoming a man. God in human flesh. But then, and lots of people were crucified. Lots of people died. But the resurrection, that, that's the stamp of approval. That's the proof that's the proof that the, the pudding, that's the proof of the whole thing, you know. The proof is in the pudding. That, that, that's the proof of the whole thing because lots of people died. But a resurrection and multiple witnesses. Did you know that over 500 people witnessed the resurrection of Christ at one time? There was other witnesses that changed people's lives like his brother James and Jude who were unbelievers until the resurrection. And... Um, it's, it's, it's rather amazing. But that's the way God rolls. God has given, bottom line, God has given a multitude of evidence down through the centuries. Multitude of evidence. A person has to deny in order to remain an unbeliever. It's kind of amazing. Amazing when you think about it. You know, Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. Zechariah 12.10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me. Notice the personal tone there. They will pronoun, look at me, the one they have pierced. That piercing in his side. 
He was also numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12 says this. And Isaiah 53, uh, once you begin to look at the crucifixion and the things surrounding that, and you go back and read Isaiah 53, 12, you can say, oh, God was telling us in advance what he was going to do uh, and, and kind of summarized it in one chapter, Isaiah 53. But Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Who were the two people crucified on either side of him? Criminals, the thief on the cross. Two people that had probably participated in an insurrection against Rome, along with Barabbas, and Barabbas was the one that they called for, set him free, crucified Jesus. So he was numbered with the transgressors, um, and, for the, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. But Isaiah 53 verse 9 also says that he was with the rich in his death. So he's numbered with transgressors, with criminals, and he's with the rich in his death. Listen to Isaiah 53 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. His assigned grave would have been one of two things, either cast along the side of the road or if Jewish people would have had their way, they would have been taken to uh, their, their um, garbage pit, which was in the Valley of Hinnom, uh, sometimes referred to as Gehenna, where there was the, the fire never went out, the, bur- the fire always was burning the trash, and they would take a body of a criminal and they would throw it there. If somebody was a more upstanding in their death, they would arrange for them uh, to be buried. So he's with the rich. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. That was his assigned grave and with the rich in his death. Now, this is where Joseph and Nicodemus come in. Remember Nicodemus? Nick at night, John chapter 3. Uh, and that's not original with me, but you can, if you look up a s- sermons on the internet about Nicodemus, you'll, John 3, you'll see tons of them called Nick at Night. So anyway, Nicodemus from John chapter 3, Jesus, he's the one that Jesus said, you got to be born again if you want to see the kingdom of heaven. And apparently Nicodemus, somewhere along the line, became a follower of Christ. And then there's Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph and Nicodemus were both Pharisees, which meant that they were on the Jewish ruling council that sentenced Jesus to death. It doesn't mean they cast their vote towards his death, but that, that maybe they got so disgusted by what their fellow Jews were doing with Jesus and, and that they finally decided to come out in the open. And, and so Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, so he was with the rich in his death. Secret disciples no more. They overcame their fear. Came out into the open. John uh, told us earlier in John 9.22 that anyone who acknowledged Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And being put out of a synagogue would be different than uh, being kicked out of a church. Because you get kicked out of a church, you can go and you go to another church. You're still going to go to the grocery store. You're still going to buy. You're still going to buy, trade, sell. You get kicked out of the synagogue. You were that was you're kicked out of the Israelite community. The people weren't going to do business with you. And so the threat was, if you acknowledge Jesus to be the Messiah, you will be kicked out of the synagogue. And so there were many people who had come to faith in Jesus, believed in him, but they were silent, afraid to say anything. Can you relate to that? Afraid of being laughed at, made fun of, mocked, teased? You believe that stuff? Nicodemus, and, and especially it says specifically of, uh, of, of Joseph that uh, um, he came and spoke. Uh, he had, been, he would, had become a disciple uh, but had remained silent out of fear of the Jewish leaders, of course, of which he was one. Um, maybe that put a little bit of extra pressure on him. So we see yet another scripture being fulfilled. Now, we're not looking at all 300 of those. We're just looking at the ones that come about in this passage of Scripture. And next week, what we're going to see is the resurrection. Was the resurrection foretold in the Old Testament? Well, let me read you this. Isaiah 53, again, 10 and 11. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring. So uh, an offering 
uh, a lamb, a dove, was never like brought almost to the point of death and then allowed to live. So if you're an offering for sin, you die. And yet he will see his offspring. He will see those who come after him and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. After he has suffered, after his life being an offering for sin, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous one will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Justify, love. (laughs) Those who have faith in Christ, those who are trusting in that blood that was shed on our behalf. Do you know God treats us just just as if we'd never sinned? Make that personal. Just as if I'd justified, never sinned. Now that doesn't mean I've never sinned. Doesn't mean I never will. But God relates to me in terms of judgment as if I had never sinned. In other words, God makes everything right. God makes everything right between us and him. That's what justify also means. God says, you know, we, we might say to him, but, but, but look, look at my sin, look at my failure. Look at, and God says, look, I know, I know, I, yeah, I, I'm aware of all that, yeah, but I, I took care of it. I, I took care of it. I did what was necessary to take care of it. And he might say, Jeff, look at that cross. In your mind, picture Jesus dying. You know, he didn't just die on a cross. He died for your sins so that he could justify you so that he could cleanse you, so that he could forgive you, so that at the time of your death, spiritual death would pass over you and you would not go into eternity in hell. You could go into the presence of God forever and ever because of the blood, not on your doorpost, but because you've trusted in what Christ did on your behalf. And I'll relate to you as if you had never sinned. Like, wow, Christ did that for us. He did that for us. He saw the light of life. Also, Psalm 16, 9 and 10 says this, Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Now, uh, if that refers to Jesus, listen, if you go and look at Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 28, it's a little bit, let me read a portion of that. This is a sermon preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost, just a little over 40 days after this. Uh, Peter says this, fellow Israelites, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth is a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. In other words, you've seen the evidence which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead... Not allowing his Holy One to see decay. Even the resurrection was prophesied, promised, predicted in the Old Testament and fulfilled. So God has given a lot of evidence. A lot of evidence so that we can believe. John wants us to know But more than John wanting us to know, Jesus wants us to know that we can trust him. That we can trust him. And it's not a manufactured story. It's not made up. Uh, He he literally died. There was no, people have theorized that he really didn't die. It was, they call it the swoon theory, that he was almost dead and something about the coolness of the grave, that garden tomb allowed him to resuscitate. He was wrapped. Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped the linen strips. Picture paper mache, but different. Paper mache, you have strips of paper, you wrap it around a balloon or something. And, and, and that's the, the linen and the linen strips and the spices, 75, some translations say 100 pounds. That's a lot. 75 pounds on your body in prepper, and they would have done it rather quickly because Jesus needed to be in the grave by the end of Friday, sundown. 
because he was going to arise three days later. And to the Jewish mind, any portion of a day was a day. An hour would be, would be an entire day. So there was Friday, there was Saturday, and there was Sunday. And God was on a timetable, and Jesus was going to arise on the first day of the week. So all of it had to happen in a very specific, preordained way and period of time so that everything could be checked off. Not just so the checklist could be checked off, but everything necessary. Everything necessary for the forgiveness of our sins for the guarantee of eternal life. Everything necessary to prove that what God said was going to happen is exactly what happened so that we can trust the written word. These are, this is not the opinions of men that have been accumulated or created through the years, through the centuries. It's trustworthy, reliable. God wants us to know, and he has left us not eyewitnesses, but the written testimony of eyewitnesses. And we can trust it. And when you do, and if you have, you know this is true, something amazing happens inside of you. And things may not change instantly overnight, but gradually, like a seed planted in the ground. And then that begins to grow. And life begins to change. Your interests begin to change. Your desires begin to change. Fulfillment fills your heart. Peace like you've never known before. You no longer have to prove yourself by your work and by your efforts and justify your existence that you deserve to be alive because Christ has done that for you. Things begin to change and it is absolutely amazing and incredible. And God wants that for every one of us. Let's pray.